Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. How can you summarize 10 years in 10 minutes? Well, we're gonna try, and we're gonna start with mixed martial arts first. What a decade for mixed martial arts. We start off with the main company, UFC, just barely getting by, and by the end of the decade, it is this phoenix rising into the mainstream, pretty much taking the place where pro wrestling used to have the mainstream. Now we're seeing UFC action figures and magazine covers and movies and this sort of stuff that you would normally- Oh it's in New York City. It's kind of funny when wrestling was kind of fading out of the mainstream, guess who comes up and takes their spot around the 2002, 2003 level? Here comes UFC, mixed martial arts starts slowly creeping in. Well, it's not a coincidence mm -hmm. because at the time on Spike TV, you had Raw, you had UFC, and UFC did get a lot of pro wrestling fans at that time. And of course, later on when Brock Lesnar yep. became the biggest star in mixed martial arts because he's a former WF champion, NCAA champion before that coming in and doing well. But of course, the real catalyst for UFC's rise in mixed martial arts along with it, because much like WWE is wrestling to a lot of people, UFC is MMA to a lot as well. But the catalyst was the Ultimate Fighter reality series. Now that UFC's never gone back, we've really got to a place now where we're looking forward to, will GSP do the Olympics? Will they get into Madison Square Garden this year? It's been an amazing decade of growth for UFC. What do you guys think about that growth and taking a lot of their competitors along with them and absorbing them? It's it's been really great because while I was first introduced as no holds barred, you know, bare knuckles, too violent for a lot of people. And then when Zufa bought it in 01, they really added weight classes, different rules. They were starting to do that beforehand. They, they'll start, but now they, they re it was really back on pay-per-view. It was really mandated by the Fertitas and Dana White yeah. that we have to start implementing this stuff, which they were doing yeah, just they beforehand They need to really to get work accepted. on getting the, the athletic commission to really accept them everywhere they went. They met with Nevada. They met with New Jersey. They right. tried their best. So it took, it took a couple of years shows. to kind of work structure it out, but finally after a while, once they got a set rules, like unified rules, from that point on, UFC has just taken off. And when Tito was on top, when Matt Hughes was on top, they really had the big raw ramp. Mm -hmm. and they, yeah, they've but toned it down. They, yeah. Oh, yeah, they've, they've, they've toned it down a lot. They went more of the boxing style. It, it's just, hard to believe they still are banned in certain states. You'd think these states would be begging for them to come in to make some money. State revenue that they can yeah, make. How much from money they can make at the garden? I think that's what New York is finally realizing is that they can make a lot of money over MST show. Well, a parallel also with wrestling is how UFC bought out their main competitor. Pride was huge in Japan, produced a lot of great fights with different style of rules as different well. Look. But Pride, of course, had that deal where they got caught with the Yakuza. They also Other. didn't screw up their merge. They brought in a lot of the guys we wanted to see. Granted, we didn't get Fedor. But we did get a lot of Majority. those guys. Quentin Jackson, yep. you could go down the list. Well, We didn't get stuck with some guy way down the card that's he's supposed to lead this invasion. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that list, how do you go down and choose one for fight of the decade? There are so many, there are so many different fights that stand out, but to me, Fight of the Decade would be something a little more competitive. Because I did watch UFC's Top 100 and what they chose. Of course, it was Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin in the final of Ultimate Finale. It's the most significant fight in UFC it's history. It's still talked about not. a lot, though. I mean, people pull that fight in regards to his like, biggest epic title fights ever done. But no, it wasn't for really a title. It still gets talked about as if it was revered in that same light. It's one of the biggest fights to ever take place, which helped launch the UFC sure. Ultimate Fighter and look at the success it's taken on from that point on. If that fight failed... Where do UFC be? Mm -hmm. But there have been a lot of other big fights like Fedor mm -hmm. and Crow Cop that was hyped up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said it lived up to the hype. I think it was a little one-sided to be fight of the decade, in my opinion. Yeah, Not know. as one-sided as, let's say, Forrest Griffin and Anderson Silva. So those were great moments, great knockouts. But to me, fight of the decade would be something a little more even. And when I think of that, counter for counter, hold for hold, a lot of people would think Wanderlei Silva and Chuck Liddell, when they finally matched up best of Pride and best of UFC. Mm -hmm. A lot of other fights like that, but Randy Couture and Minotaro Noguera at UFC 102 in August, still one of my favorite fights I've ever seen. I was so totally into it. I was amazed watching it. And afterwards, I was looking at it like, that is why I love mixed martial arts. That was a fight of the decade to me. Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin, because that was a fight that really didn't have too much hype, and it was really 
two relatively unknown guys. So they didn't have half the crowd cheering another. The people just love to see a good fight. And that's the first time that I've seen where the crowd is really standing up and cheering after each round. Fourth spirit from one of razor thin split decision. It could have gone either way, and it's done so much to the sport. And I think that's one of the standing bears for the UFC. Matt Hughes versus Frank Trick, their second fight when Matt Hughes won. Dana White's game. favorite fight. It's awesome. Like, every time I've seen that fight since it's happened, it always reminds me of how much I really liked Matt Hughes when he was the champion or when he won back the belt, I should say. They had such a hateful story between the two of them. And when Matt they, Hughes? Well, never. Right, yeah. <laughs> the way that fight ended with that standing choke and he's squeezing the life out of Frank Trigg and he becomes the welterweight champion. The fight itself was fought tooth and nail back and forth with wrestling and everything going on. And it was to end up that choke in the, in the standing position, like, which you rarely ever see, was Awesome, just pure awesome. Chuck Liddell versus Rampage. This, Another hyped pride. It was a great hyped fight. Chuck had avenged all of his losses except for this one. Quentin, a lot of people here weren't familiar with him. You bring him in, it was kind of back and forth until Rampage catches him, goes down, and Chuck's career practically went down with him. Really? I, I would have thought that fight could have gone it a little longer, yeah. but for fight of the decade... That, I, to, that, that, really I think that was a turning much. point because also the situation we have now, Chuck seemed like he wasn't going down. He had gone through Tito, Randy, everybody. There was really nobody left for him to fight at that point. Well, Chuck Liddell is probably someone that a lot of people would say is fighter of the decade, which is another one that's so hard to narrow down. So many sources from Five Ounces of Pain, MMA Junkie, Sure Dog, UFC's own choices all say something different. Mm -hmm. Who do you say is fighter of the decade? I'm with Randy Couture. He's been through... Some of the most interesting, most compelling fights that UFC's had. He's been able to leave, come back, and still compete at a very high level with some of their younger fighters. And he always seems to pull out epic fights. The fighter to make the biggest impact in the short amount of time of Brock Lesnar. Fighter this, of the decade? This guy, let me finish, let okay. me finish, let me finish. This guy has done so much and beat very top names and great people in like, yes, yeah, five fights. But as far as the fighter of the decade, as far as accomplishments, Fedor Emelianenko. He mm -hmm. has beaten the who's who at the top of their game, and he's done it in top fashion. I agree with you. He's still undefeated in my mind. I'm not counting that cut on the nose as a loss. And Especially he, since he avenged that loss. Yeah, exactly. And he's beaten Krokop and O'Gara twice. He came back and beat a young, hungry Brett Rogers. He's eating up UFC champions for breakfast. This guy, I cannot wait to see what he does in the next decade. Chuck, he was there through thick and thin of UFC through the worst times. He was a draw when UFC wasn't what it is now. There are guys like Anderson Silva who have been middleweight champion for about three years plus now. There are guys like Matt Hughes who are already young future Hall of Famers like George St. Pierre as well. Wanderlei Silva is very accomplished. There's a lot of choices, but I think at the end of the day, the real story in mixed martial arts is MMA's own Rocky. And that would be Seth Petrozelli. No, I'm joking, <laughs> joking. I mean Randy Couture. Mm -hmm. To be a two-time heavyweight and light heavyweight champion, two different divisions, to come back at his age and do so well against guys that they put him against these monsters like Tim Sylvia, Brock Lesnar. Another fight of the decade candidate right there. Randy's comeback fight, and it's still a classic fight to this day. And still people would probably love to see that Fedor Couture match that they never got to see. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we do get to see it at some point, but we're going to move on and talk about the decade in review for pro wrestling. Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. Rejoining the panel is Shane Hagedorn, and pro wrestler is going to talk about the Wrestling Decade Interview. And I wanted to have you on specifically because you started off the decade, like the rest of us, as a fan. Yes. You ended it as a pro wrestler. You just made a comeback at Pro Wrestling Respect in Burlington, New Jersey on January 24th. DVD is coming soon. We wanted to get your unique perspective on it because the landscape of wrestling has changed so dramatically in the past 10 years. It's been almost nine since WCW and ECW both died within weeks of each other. <laughs> and they were on a really steady, maybe even fast downfall in the past couple years. WCW became a very sad shell of its former self. And by former self, I mean only a year or two beforehand. ECW, Paul Heyman spent way too much money, apparently. Didn't he get support from the network? <laughs> and the, the network. And the bottom two of the big three went defunct. And in their place, of course, Ring of Honor sprung up another year or so later to try and take that smart mark place at number three. And TNA was started to basically be a new WCW. And almost eight years later, they're really getting their wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least those two popping up gave indie wrestlers a different avenue instead of going to WWE and sure. getting WWE-ized. 
But what are your thoughts on how this whole landscape has changed? Because in buying WCW and ECW, we also got the after effect of the brand split, which goes on to this day. And people in our demographic who may have just tuned in for the first time since WCW, perhaps for the January 4th Monday Night War, we really don't particularly care for a lot of the way wrestling is presented nowadays. And that's what we've said on the show more often than not. However, WWE may not be mainstream now, like MMA might be, but they're still making a bigger profit than they practically ever have been. They're making millions of buys on WrestleMania just on the name WrestleMania alone. They're still doing well, even though we disagree creatively with what they do. So where do you think wrestling stands right now? I think it's hard to call anything that's still getting three-point-something ratings as not being mainstream. To me, it's still mainstream but it's not at that level it was sure when every kid in school was wearing a austin 316 or an mwo shirt well people call tna a failure too and yeah. they're making a profit exactly a lot of people consider it a failure creatively mm -hmm. they've all had their ups and downs wwe with the smackdown six era in ring wise that was probably the best section of wrestling this entire decade mm -hmm. um, tna Easily. with the x division when it first really got started and they actually were focusing on it was giving you wrestling that you weren't going to see on WWE. Ring of Honor presented the, that same thing. You had so many... Well, Ring of Honor started off with its reputation as we're going to be about pure wrestling and give these guys the avenue. And when mm -hmm. they put guys like Chris Daniels and AJ Styles and Loki and Brian Danielson in there and tore it up, yep. that's how they filled the Murphy Rec Center in Southern Philadelphia. Wrestling's still there in people's minds. It's just it's not at the forefront the way it was during the height of the Monday Night Wars. Right, and I think beginning of the decade, we saw the end of the Attitude Era and then we saw the disappointment era, the invasion. I think that's when, as a fan, I really started turning away from it because you go through disappointment and disappointment. And then the Brock era, as I like to call it, when wrestling, the SmackDown 6, and you had the Angle Benoit, mm -hmm. and you had these great physical matches. And at the same time, on the other show, you had Triple H versus WCW, where it's being Steiner and Booker T and Nash Goldberg. and Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And then after the post Brock era, I think that's when it started going down a little bit after WrestleMania 20. And then they tried doing everything they could for the past decade, I feel, trying to go back to the Attitude Era because they're still comparing themselves to the height where they once were. And I think that times have changed so much where they can't keep going back to the same thing as much as they want to try. And here we are, 2010, we're still DX. And we're still getting Michael's Undertaker in the main event. That We were complaining last year when they were doing that, that it was old. I don't yeah. complain. I, I, I think First it's funny that it's 2010, Undertaker's still champion. Mm -hmm. We started off the decade with Triple H's champion, now we have Sheamus. Well, know? we started off the decade with, on the one night, same segment, Bret and Michaels and the NWO, where I could swear there was a night in it January was in 1997 where mm -hmm. I was flipping back in the <laughs> same situation. Exactly, yeah. Except that everybody's a lot fatter now. That's the only difference. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone looks a lot older, but those are the guys that are still here. And the big stories in wrestling deaths this decade are the major ones. Of course, we're talking about Eddie Guerrero and he who we do not speak of both of whom were the prominent guys at WrestleMania 20. Yeah. Just a few years later, both yeah. of them are dead. And it's really unfortunate, but there's been a lot of fallout. Of course, Crispin, uh, he who we do not speak of, is a major issue that's still very touchy. That's why we started off our first season a couple years ago talking about that. We know it's on the tips of everybody's tongue. It's a major issue, and that involves the wellness policy that was implemented after Eddie Guerrero died. Now, Eddie Guerrero did get a comeback based on the fact he was clean, at least of alcohol. No one stopped him from doing all the other stuff that eventually led to his death as well, or at least had a big part of it. So where do you think wrestling goes from here? They're getting a lot of political attention now with Linda McMahon. There was that Senate investigation in the post-Benoit era. Do you think wrestling really has to change with the times, if not just to protect their employees, I mean, independent contractors, but also because UFC's breathing down their back, do they need to change stylistically at all, or are they should just going to keep doing what they do? I don't know about changing stylistically, but as far as like the wellness policy, you can give them some credit, see if they are taking steps to make it stronger. If you're a mid card, stronger. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna oh. take another Benoit situation for them to really change. I don't see McMahon doing anything to change that. The only thing that's gonna happen is if the State Athletic Commission start testing all the wrestlers. And now they're entertainment and that's they're how they superstars, get around it. Yeah. so that's how they get around it. 
well, they did institute that you can call it the Jeff Hardy policy, for lack of a better word, the rehiring policy, where if you were fired for wellness policy violations, you come back in with two strikes against you already. So you're already pretty much have your neck on the chopping block if you screw up. I think that's their way of protecting themselves from situations like what happened with Hardy. Well, especially with Jeff Hardy being the biggest draw that they've had in a few years, for him to be busted with so many drugs so soon after his yes. contract expired yes. as well, they yes. dodged yes. the bullet there. But not just that, when they put the belt on him finally for about a month at the most, you know that was, we don't want to risk having this guy get caught as our champion. Right? Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's going to take a lot to clean this place up. There's just too much behind this. I don't think it's possible. You got these guys putting their bodies on the line, 300 days plus a year, on the road, partying and doing whatever. It's not going to change. I don't think it's anything that's really going to significantly change about it. Well, hopefully there would be some change, but we are going to move on regardless and talk about match of the decade. Much like mixed martial arts, fight of the decade, how do you narrow it down to one or two matches? There have been so many good ones, but we're going to try. What do you think is match of the decade, Rodney? The one that I will always enjoy it was the true dream match of the decade with WrestleMania 18, Hogan vs. Rock. What was it like in the arena? I was deaf. <laughs> and, wow. What was it like it in was... the Hooters uh, half of the country away? It, it felt like I was live watching there because everyone was standing. The crowd was not dead the whole time. Rock really transitioned very well to play that heel role. It really built up to be a great match. It's it lives up to our expectations. From Toronto in the building to a Hooters in Florida and everywhere in between, I think everyone turned into little kids watching that match. Oh. Being there live, it was an example of how phenomenal The Rock is because with that match and with another potential, The Brock match, you get to see how The Rock just read the crowd and Hogan read the crowd and Brock, even for being that inexperienced, read the crowd and just turned... They actually it, listened, and they became the match became what the crowd fed into it, and it was just a phenomenal example of how, even at I don't know how old he was, fifty seven thousand years old, Hogan at the time, <laughs> even then how great of a worker he still was in the real sense of the word. Yes. Yeah, I love nothing more than watching two guys go in there and just fight it out, guts, heart, and that's the Royal Rumble match with Angle and what's his face. <laughs> yeah. That was beautiful to watch. It's hard to deny, even with everything that's happened, that he who we do not speak of did give us a lot of great matches mm -hmm. in this decade. A lot of great and moments. that match at the Rumble, way up there. And, the, and there's always going to be an argument of, and it's tough, I admit, I can see both sides of the story, of do you still applaud his matches because of the quality or because of everything? What, what do you do because of... Or um, realize that every bump he takes is one step closer to the homicide? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it, it's hard for me to not look back and see and how phenomenal that match was regardless of sure. everything else that came afterwards. AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe versus Christopher Daniels. Wow. TNA, unbreakable. It showcases the X Division. If you want to show somebody anything from TNA, that's the match you show them. It's hard to deny that that's the best match they've ever produced. I think it's the best of the decade. I don't think anybody can top it. Well, the match they just had a couple months ago at Turning Point, years later, yeah. was incredible. It's it still literally good. was yeah. total nonstop action. Mm -hmm. And then coupled with the Desmond Wolf kurt Angle kurt match Angle, on that, yeah. it was incredible Great night double for main event for TNA. If only the rest of the stuff they do wasn't so shaky, they could put on a good product. It made me think of Joe and Angle. In no, lockdown, no, lockdown. Yeah, lockdown. Any, lockdown. any of their matches that they had. Mm -hmm. The lockdown one, I think, the lockdown the one, just how, how much potential that TNA has mm -hmm. to put on those phenomenal Well, look at how matches. much they, they put behind like that, that match. And the buy rates went up huge. Mm -hmm. Huge. Mm -hmm. And then they don't do it again. You mentioned before Rock and Brock at SummerSlam 2002. That's still a match that I love, but my favorite match of the decade is one I was in the building for. And that was Brian Danielson defending the ROH title against Kenta from Pro Wrestling Noah. Glory by Honor 5 at the Manhattan Center in New York City. It was one of those matches that you watch and you just be proud that you're in wrestling or you are a wrestling fan. It was just incredible to watch because Danielson had that separated shoulder or that shoulder injury that was really hurting him for about a month. He was in some serious pain. Yeah. Knowing how much pain for real that he was going in mm -hmm. to that match with and to be able to put on that dramatic caliber of a match it's one of the proudest and greatest moments I've ever seen. Probably the best match I've ever seen in person. But that was performed by a great wrestler, and you need to be a great wrestler to be wrestler of the decade. So the big one, who do you think is wrestler of the decade? Danielson. The guy had so many memorable matches with everybody in Ring of Honor. Cabana, Nigel, 
Kenta. Low key. And every low key. It can go on and on about how great this guy is. And he can work with anybody on the roster at any time. Even Morishima, someone as big as him. Tyler Black, Davey Richards, no matter who's there. Danielson, you got this guy tonight. Danielson will get a great match. Jimmy Jacobs, guy. BJ yep. Whitmer. He's had a lot of great matches with a and lot of great one of, people. One of my favorite feuds, oh, with Aries matches that he oh, had they a few were years ago. How great were those? At the end of the decade, he was feeling like he'd done everything in independent wrestling. He's probably right. There's not much more for him to do, but seeing him walk out at that dark yep. match against Chavo the other week, it was surreal because it feels like, yes, this is the guy that might get me to really get into – TV again and see how they progress. He with deserves him. it. He deserves all the success he has. But he's he's just he in, had incredible match after incredible match from 2000 to 2010. Torn between Kurt Angle and Danielson mm -hmm. because I know Brian personally. I've seen firsthand how hard he works, how much he puts into his matches, into training, how much he gave himself in that match, how hard he fought from that point until the end of the year before he took his time off. I've seen the guts and determination that Brian has. Not to mention the phenomenal quality of matches. But then Angle's the same. I don't know if I've ever seen a bad Kurt Angle match. Mm -hmm. That first impact when they moved to Thursday nights, Abyss, I'm not a high on Abyss, but that match was great. Kane, draw that great match out of people that you never thought you'd see it out of. It's kind of a tie. I, don't, I really can't pick just one between those two. Kurt Angle, I would say hands down, but I think he should be a heavy favorite. Yeah. This guy did not have a lot of years of training in pro wrestling, and usually crossover athletes coming into pro wrestling only get to a certain level. This guy went straight to the top of the tier of wrestlers. He made the guys better who was wrestling. Right? He put on great matches. He put a whole new style to it. He brought in the amateur wrestling and really just made the guys better who he was working with. Plus, he was great on the mic. Yeah. Great cutting promos. He went to TNA, made those guys better, brought the elevation or at least the attention of TNA up a little bit. That guy just from 2000 to 2009 has been on top. Now, a lot of these picks are obviously very American-centric. There might be some that might be from Japan, Mexico, Canada, Europe, some other sort of wrestling area. Of course, we're concentrating more on what we've seen, but of what we've seen, a lot of people might say Shawn Michaels, a lot of people might say somebody else, but I would have to agree with most of you guys that Kurt Angle has to be it. If for the Olympic gold medal, if nothing else. Yeah. There's been no one else like him in professional wrestling. In my mind, if you put a gun to my head and said, who's the greatest wrestler ever from the 1900s all the way to now, it would have to be Kurt Angle. Yeah. No one else has had the legitimacy. No one else has had the success in both amateur worlds as an NCAA and gold medalist and professional wrestling worlds where he can do practically anything. It's unfortunate that he's one of those personalities that's had a lot of problems recently with his physical health, with drug problems. But regardless of that, when you put him in the ring, it's incredible from... It's magic. I was there at Survivor Series when he had his first official match. It amazed me to see how far he came just so within a year. Mm -hmm. Just from that first year. I think a real measure of how really good a wrestler is, much like Bret Hart in the same vein, possibly Bret Hart would be the 90s, Kurt Angle would be the 2000s, right. is if a lot of other wrestlers can say, my greatest match ever was with that guy. Bret Hart was like that, but for the 2000s, it's got to be Kurt Angle. He would get the best match of the career of whoever he wrestled out of so many different people, so many different times. But hopefully you got something out of this conversation as well, because that's it for the Decade in Review for Pro Wrestling and Mixed Martial Arts. Join us next month. We're going to be talking about TNA's Genesis pay-per-view, WWE's Royal Rumble. Who do you want to see come back to wrestling the most, and who do you want to see leave the most? And we want to remind you to send in questions for the Q&A. Eventually, we want to do another submission round this season. Just remember to include your first name and location. We also want to mention our affiliates. Go Fight Live, check them out on GoFightLive.tv. Ring of Honor Wrestling, check them out on ROHWrestling.com. And Pro Wrestling Respect. Go to ProWrestlingRespect.com. And don't forget to go to WrestlingRoundTable.com for all the content around the show. So for the panel, Alex Payne, Shane Hagedorn, Rodney LeConte, Chris Harris, I'm your host, Eric Santa Maria. Thank you and join us next month. And on WrestlingRoundTable.com.